All right. Uh, well, uh, this is the first of two classes, and it's going to synthesize um, historical information. I've got a bunch of books on the tournaments plus a bunch of primary sources. We're also going to look at uh, the experience gained in the tournament companies movement in the 1990s, when a bunch of us set up uh, small tournament companies to specifically to exercise ourselves in arms, to create a better appearance on the field and, and study uh, historical tournaments. Um, and then look at a little bit about how the PAW could be used today, given the changes in the community day from the 1990s. Um, so I get some ideas on that. I'm curious as to your ideas as well. So this slide basically just says I've been around forever. Um, and we've been curious and interested in this stuff since the late 80s and into the early 1990s. Um, started out doing SCA stuff. Um, I always wanted to know why the SCA tournament worked. What, what were the mechanisms that were operating that caused it to function and survive for so long? Um, that led to a bunch of the period uh, surviving pieces. And uh, from there, a distillation and founding of some companies um, and then some exercise from primarily in the late 80s and 90s, but into the 2000s. In about 2000, we started emphasizing the medieval flight books a little bit more um, instead of the tournaments. And you know, part of me kind of regrets that we didn't, we went so far away from the tournaments. I think we should have stepped a little bit closer to those. Um, but things have been happening in the interim. We'll cover some of that too. Uh, so um, this is fun stuff. I'm passionately moved by it. And I hope uh, that you'll find some interest in it too. Um, so today, the environment's very different. In the 90s, we only had pretty much the SCA and there wasn't anything else. And so we set up the tournament companies um, trying to add something more to the SCA, not to change everything, um, but just to add another way that you could go about the same sort of tournament experience. Um, today, there's a lot more. There's HEMA, there's the ACL, BOTM, uh, there's the SCA. Uh, some people do LARPs. There are a lot of different ways people are exercising themselves in arms. And there are a lot of different tournament formats out there. Uh, but really, none of them really uh, is very similar to the historical pot arms. I mean, I think that the historical pot arms can be very, very useful uh, across the spectrum, not only in these individual groups, but also for binding them together. You can have tournaments that actually cross over, which is kind of fun. Uh, the pot arms itself is really a challenge tournament. And to get right down to it, the point of it is really a series of defenders, tenons, as they call themselves, almost where the word tenants comes from, uh, get together and decide to hold a place, a river ford, a bridge, a uh, section of fence, um, just a place under a tree. Um, and from that, this comes out of romance initially, um, doing the sort of nightly uh, entreaties or errancy challenge. Um, but over the course of the Middle Ages, as we'll see, the events got much larger and they became giant festivals. Well, today you can have events all the way from one or two individuals just deciding to hold the field for a while, all the way up through um, a huge planned event with 100 participants and so on. Um, so there's a lot of room, historically and today. Uh, one of the big things, though, with the pod that I think was misunderstood by some folks in the 90s is that you've got to have uh, the focus still on the fighting. Uh, you have the other things surrounding the fighting that creates an important stage, but you want to encourage prowess is one of the aspects that you're testing. So it's important to have the heraldic display and the, the sort of uh, sincere talk and all that. When you get right down to it, you still have to have the fighting. Um, and it's important. And it's the way that we actually exercise it. The PA field is designed using heraldry and pavilions and fencing and so on to try and create a focus point for um, what's going on in the field. So it becomes a stage. And the SCA has known this for a long time. Um, and has used this effectively, and I think HEMA is discovering it to some degree. Um, and the ACL is obviously very aware of the stage. Um, and the PA builds on all those things. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on Friday, but some today as well. Let's see, maybe another couple people here. All right. So um, we're going to source this. A lot of the stuff, the actual information for this, come from surviving chronicles, uh, but also romance and chivalric biographies. We have some good sources for some of this stuff, um, and it'll give you a chance to draw from some history. We'll look at a series of those today as we go. Oops. All right, so today we're gonna cover the three top points. Um, the idea of renown, this is absolutely essential for understanding how the medieval tournament works, uh, the deed of arms, whether it be war, tournaments, or jousts. Um, and then we'll talk about the tournament companies, 
and then we'll talk about uh, the pot arms itself and what my possibilities might hold today. And on Friday, we'll look at it from the combatant's perspective, um, defining the core elements, um, and then we'll look at it from the organizer's perspective and different things to keep in mind, some sort of lessons learned and uh, TTPs and stuff that we've come up with. Um, and then finally, we'll look at sources both today and on Friday. Um, so going this far, do I have any questions so far? Let's go ahead and unmute if you do. No? All right, we'll go on. Okay, the first thing, the core concept um, is this idea of renown. You know, we've sort of heard the word, often in English text, it'll be called worshipfulness. Um, it's kind of reputation, but it has a military component to it. Um, so the medieval legal idea of fama is sort of related to this, but it's not exactly the same. Renown is earned primarily on the field, and it's the uh, judgment of your peers primarily about how you comport yourself on the field. There's a giant academic argument concerning whether prowess is the center virtue here or whether it's the only virtue, um, but most of us would agree it's not the only virtue. Um, and the point of the pot arms is really to showcase all of the virtues. But taking from Geoffrey Charnay, 14th century knight, um, who established with King Jean II, um, the company of the star, wrote in his manuscript, um, Partui fait d'armes font bien, alloué à tous ceux qui bien y font ce qui a prêté de faire, which means for all deeds of arms merit praise, for those who perform well in them. He says all of them. He's very serious about that. And he'll go on in the text to discuss uh, more uh, numbers of those. If you haven't looked at Charnay's book before, um, I do recommend it. The one on the left, the Knight's Own Book of Chivalry, is sort of a scaled down version without the face to face. Uh, translations. If you don't read the French, then it's not that useful to you anyway. Um, the other version is the original version uh, that Kennedy and Kuiper did. It's also useful. There's nothing on pot arms in here per se, um, but there's a lot in here about the chivalric mindset and from an actual knight's perspective, not from a church perspective, not from a romance perspective, but actually from a knight's perspective in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. So a uh, great source if you haven't seen it before. Uh, the manuscript on here, by the way, is from the first page of his Livre de Chevalerie, uh, which is in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. I've got a PDF of that thing. Okay, so Charnay breaks it down into a spectrum of all arms. Um, and he's talking about deeds of arms here. So for Charnay, and across the board medievally really, deeds of arms encompass war, tournaments, and joust. And Charnay says, and so I say, he who does more is more worthy, meaning, that renown increases with the risk. The, there's sort of a distinction here in that all the participants of a medieval feat of arms earn renown, not just the winner. So just by participating, your name is improved um, by uh, exhibiting yourself and testing yourself in arms. You might win more if you do more or if there's more risk according to it, but the idea is that it's a win-win thing, not a win-lose thing. Um, that's a very great distinction from, say, a double elimination tournament where you're out and you're done. So this is not like that at all. In this, you have a number of passes to demonstrate your prowess. And in each pass, you have an opportunity to win or lose renown, depending upon what you do. So um, it's not a jousting check where you might have an elimination round or something like that. Um, but it sort of gets at the idea that the renown, is, the renown mechanism never really goes away. You're never just watching. So um, for Charnay, war is the most worthy, and that's because there's more risk in war. We sort of echo this today with the respect we give to soldiers who have seen combat and so on. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Um, tournaments next, because they were more dangerous. They were group encounters um, with groups of horsemen, one upon the other. There's different kinds. We'll look at that next. And then jousts, one-on-one -on -one thing. All are dangerous, all demonstrate sort of expertise in arms and give the opportunity for demonstrations, as we'll see, um, but uh, some are more worthy than others. So war at the top, tournaments in the middle, and jousts at the bottom. Anybody want to comment on or have a question about Charnay? All right. So looking at war, war is a deed of arms, uh, just like a tournament or a joust is. 
This quote I like. For this reason, you should love, value, praise, and honor all whom God, by his grace, has granted several good days on the battlefield, and they win great credit and renown for their exploits. For it is from good battles that great honors arise and are increased, where good fighting men prove themselves in good battles, where they show their worth in their own locality without traveling outside of it. Now, he gives a different amount of credit depending upon how far away from your local area the war is. So a large war crusade can give the most credit to and then on down to a local war. Um, but war, because of the risk, um, carries more renown with it. And he says in there that key phrase, that they win great credit and renown for their exploits here. So he's, demonstrating, he's saying that you know, your participation in the war will give you a great deal of renown. And we're gonna try to capture some of that in the pot arms, knowing that it's not war, that it's a step down. So next would be tournaments in his scale. And he says, we should talk then of another pursuit at which many men at arms aim to make their reputation. That is at deeds of arms and tournaments. And indeed, they earn men praise and esteem for they require a great deal of wealth, equipment, and expenditure. That sounds familiar. Physical hardship, crushing and wounding, and sometimes danger of death. For this kind of practice in arms, there are some whose physical strength, skill, and agility enable them to perform so well, they achieve in this activity such great renown for their fine exploits, and because they often engage in it, their renown and their fame increases in their own territory and that of their neighbors. Thus, they want to continue this kind of pursuit of arms because of the success God has granted them in it. And this is a good passage just to sort of keep in mind uh, for how the tournament actually works. Because he's saying that you're, by participating in it, um, suffering the physical hardship, you know, the potential of wounding, showing the great strength, not only to receive blows, but also to give them. Um, that that's where the renown comes from. Um, so for Charnay, this is a laudable thing. And I think Charnay probably does reflect the attitude of a lot of knights, um, even not particularly ideological ones. Um, so uh, we're pulling here directly from something. The image is from the Manessa Codex from the early, well, early to mid 14th century, sometime between 1304 and 1340 when it was completed. And you should see a lot of heraldic color in it um, and some grappling and wrestling. This is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about tournament per se. Um, first started out that way. We'll talk a little more about that in a second. And then finally, jousts. These are the ones who are physically strong and, and skillful and who conduct themselves properly and pleasantly, as is appropriate for young men, gentle, courteous, and well-mannered towards others, who have no desire to engage in any evil undertaking, but are so eager to perform deeds of arms at joust that they, when they hear of activities or other occasions for jousting, they will be there if they can. If all goes well, they will usually win their contest and learn the prize. So he doesn't seem to know what periods are, does he? Just kind of goes on forever. Um, so the joust is similar. I mean, you don't see much difference in it in terms of um, all the key elements are there. You're uh, competing one-to-one, -one, you're picking up the same risk, although it's a little less risk, so a little less renown is earned as well. Um, but you can still earn renown in the joust. So this idea of renown is going to be central to the idea of the pot arms. And you have to keep it in mind because it's what everything at the pot arms is structured to reinforce the renown of the participants. Um, and so the idea is to try and build up that renown. So when Charnay talks about tournaments, there's a whole slew of things that he's really talking about. Um, there's a couple good books on this. Um, Juliet Barker, um, The Tournament in England, 1100 to 1400. I recommend that one highly. And then Richard Barber and Juliet Barker's book on tournaments. These are the two key books uh, that sort of survey the tournament experience over the Middle Ages. So I recommend both of those. Um, Julia Barker's phrase for the earliest tournaments in the 11th, early 12th century, she called it the simulacra of battle. So everything is present in the thing except the intent to kill. They're basically two groups of horsemen fighting between two towns. Um, and it's basically just practice for the horsemen. Now in doing this, they would run over people's crops and you know, break things and so on. So the church didn't really take kindly to this. Um, and out of this, you get the peace and truce of God. Um, in fact, it's a 13th century instance when someone brought crossbowmen on the field. Um, this is generally viewed to be a non chivalrous thing, but they did it. Um, so pretty rough and tumble. Uh, the general Latin term for this early on are hasaludes, or spear games. And this could be anything. Now, these are primarily mounted games. You don't see a lot of foot activity going on here, which distinguishes it from what we do today, where we have 95% foot activity with a little bit of equestrian stuff. Um, they still think we can get up the gist, the gist of it. Uh, the medieval Bay Horde, this can cause quite a bit of turbulence in today's world because, of course, some of the Eastern European and Russian folks call what they do Bay Hordes. 
uh, but they're fighting with her baited steel. And as far as my research shows, that's basically behors were fought with batons of ash or willow or uh, whale baleen and with kerboily armor or quilted armor. So not terribly different from what the SCA is doing in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, but behords were generally held before the main event sometimes, and sometimes they were the main event. Um, you'll see all kinds of interesting references to them in Germanic and French literature, both. Um, then there's the sort of Hundred Years' War, what they sort of called a feat of arms, the combat of authority held under the old oak tree. Basically two, um, uh, what I call them, two, uh, let's see, uh, garrisons that decided to meet up and earn renown during a period of truce. So they set a time under this old oak tree and they went at each other. These were, there were not very many knights taking, taking part, a few, but most of them were squires and unbelt, what we think of as unbelts. Um, and it got pretty rough and tumble, uh, very different than what you might have at a formal tournament or a round table, uh, but renown earning. And I think today's ACL or BOTN very much captures the spirit of what was going on in the combat of the 30. So that's a good analog for that. Um, then there was the round table, which some pot arms are round tables. These are Arthurian style events where people are taking on the persona of somebody in Arthur's court. So heavily anchored in romance, you know, I come as Gawain today or Parsifal or something like that. Um, and it's half acting, half fighting. Um, so it's a little bit different than what we might think of as a true sort of pot arms, although a lot of the pot arms did use an Arthurian theme. Um, so the round table very much comes out of romance, whereas the combat of 30, that's a pure battlefield thing. The horde is a battlefield thing. Best moves battlefield thing. Um, the round table is probably half drama and half fighting. Uh, the pot arms, though, the challenge style format that we're going to spend our time talking about um, is usually but not always Arthurian, um, and it has some themes in it, too, sometimes. So... A series of things there. Any questions on these? All right. Would you so consider, hold on, would you consider the uh, pot of arms or the round table a late medieval uh, creation when they were trying to recapture the glory days of chivalric activity? Or would that, does that present a trend throughout early and late medieval period? Yeah, I think it's a, you see it starting in the 13th century because Ulrich von Lichtenstein will um, do his Venus fart going around Europe dressed as a woman, actually. Um, he tried it as a man first and nobody would challenge him. So he came out in the dress and brought gold rings with him and was basically trying to follow some of the Arthurian, you know, knightly errant things going around and getting, doing challenges here and there. Um, and you see it starting in the 13th century, but definitely it went, and increased in pitch during the 14th century, and particularly the second half of the 14th century. The pot arms itself really shows up in the second half of the 14th century. Um, and we don't have a lot of records for the details of what happened in a lot of these, but uh, we do know they existed. Uh, Edward III was very, very uh, major sponsor of these sort of things in late uh, 14th century, well, middle 14th century England, and then they continued along. In the 15th century, the, pot arm, the round table sort of starts to go away and the pot arms is mostly dominant at that point. And then some of these become giant festivals in the 15th century. We'll see some quotes from some of these here. So hopefully that'll give you a better idea of how it looks. But good question, Sam, thanks. Any others? All right, we'll go on then. Let's talk about what the pot arms is. So this is Barber and Barker's definition of it. Um, I might define it a little bit differently, but this is a good one from uh, some respected authorities. In the late 14th century, a new form of combat evolved, made to last long, as long as somebody wanted. Um, I've inserted the pot arms piece there, um, based on the episodes of Arthurian romance. They aren't always based on that, but that's all right. Uh, where knights undertook to defend a given place, usually a ford or a bridge in single combat until they were defeated. So these scenes, if you read any Arthurian romance, they, they appear over and over again in Arthurian romance. And that's basically what these are recreating, is that idea. I'm going to defend this ford, this bridge, this fence, this part of the field uh, for as long as I can. And over time, to sort of get at your point, Sam, uh, heraldry will become more and more important as the 14th century rolls on and into the 15th, to where you've got the whole thing sort of covered in heraldic display. 
and shiny armor and so on. And that will become, because each one is trying to outdo the other one. Chivalry is, however, as you say, though, sort of always backward looking towards an ideal time. And you can sense that in these pods. The idea is to try and get back towards the roots of what chivalry really is or what soldiers ought to be doing. Um, so it's sort of a both, both of these things. And part of that is because romance itself is supposed to be sort of a teaching tool uh, for the Knights of the Middle Ages. They read the romances, they're entertaining and all, but they always present moral, ethical, or physical problems to, to solve. And they're meant as a way of uh, conveying those concepts to the Knights today, either by they're read to the Knights or they're read. We can argue about what the literacy might have been. But um, I think amongst people who are participating in these pot arms, literacy was pretty high. We're talking about the second half of the 14th century into the 15th and throughout the 15th. Um, so the key elements here, you always have one or more tenons or defenders holding the field. And they declare their intention in advance, they're gonna do this, they set up, um, usually with a heraldic display of some sort, and then they hold the field. And you see these scenes in romance, we'll see one as we go on here. Um, that's the key piece right off. Sometimes there's a theme, I'd say most times in history there's a theme, but um, in the reenactments in the 90s, um, that wasn't always the case, and they still work just fine. So the key mechanisms seem to be there, whether or not you have a theme. But a theme can help tie it together. Um, it's always a challenge format. So uh, the, the venon will come along, and they will challenge a tenon. And we, we tend to run them in rounds or passes. Every round, each venon will have a chance to challenge anyone they like, any venon. And as we'll talk next time, um, we, I never would balance the sides. So it might be that as a a tenon, you might have three challenges one round. Um, that's perfectly fine. You might also have no challenges one round. That tells you something too. Like nobody wants to challenge you. Um, so I would tend not to do that. But that seems to be a key element, um, whether you, uh, there's always the challenge component. It's not a tree or anything of that sort. Um, and then also important is always, it's a full spectrum of chivalric virtues. So however you think of those, um, charity, franchise, prowess, generosity, etc. cetera. Um, this is an opportunity to show all the virtues, including prowess. So um, you definitely try to show those as, your, um, as you make opportunities on the field. And if you're hosting one of these, the idea is to try to set up circumstances whereby people have the opportunity to show it and are encouraged to do it. And there's some tricks that we'll talk about on Friday uh, to pulling that out sometimes. You can do it alone without a staff, certainly, if you're running a small event. It becomes more challenging as the event gets bigger. Uh, but, and uh, pacing becomes important because you want to keep people busy and fighting, or at least a focus on the field going on. And that can be something of a challenge as the, group, as the thing grows in size. I mean, as I mentioned before, it can start off as just a little thing with just you. Um, I've done a couple times just me in a pavilion with a table with some refreshments on it and a bunch of matched weapons. And then other times there have been huge events where you have 100 combatants come and fight. So all those count, and they're, both, they're all pot arms, but the scale is obviously somewhat different. And tomorrow I'll break them into three levels to sort of give an idea of what, how different they can be at each of those levels, things to look at, look for. All right, so the first of our historical examples, this is not actually a tournament, but it's one of the romantic examples where um, a lot of this sort of challenging theme comes from. Uh, we're not going to read it all to you, but you can read it perfectly well yourself. Uh, but the key thing is that Yvain comes up, he finds a bowl of water, he pours the bowl of water, some of the water, onto a stone. This is a recurring theme, which we'll see in several of the um, 15th century pot arms that go on. And then, in response, a knight comes out, and he does the challenge then. Now, remember that almost always, almost always but not always, these were mounted events. So you break a number of spears on your opponent and so on. We don't really have the same equestrian culture going today, um, and it's more expensive, so we generally do this on foot. But as you'll see, there are several examples of these things being done on foot too, and that becomes more uh, likely as the 15th century goes on. Um, they get rid of the horses and do some of these things on foot, particularly with pole axes and spears and things of that sort. So um, you can see all of the colorful stuff here. They each swing mighty spears, slash and smashing away, so the shields are cracked, the shoulders are male or broken, spears are split and splintered, pieces flying in the air, blah, blah, blah. Very romance literature um, sort of text here. Um, but this is essentially what they're trying to recreate. So they're trying to get at, bring this action 
to the center of the field so that you can see, so that the other combatants and the spectators can be focused on the renown that's being worn by both combatants here as it goes on. Um, and, and even in, in literature, you'll see that in a fight, rarely is the person who's vanquished shamed by that vanquishment, unless they've uh, exhibited cowardice or they're fighting for a poor cause. If the cause is good, and in the pod we always assume that it is, because uh, you declare what you're going to be fighting for right up front, then um, it'll be a net plus for both people, unless someone you know, blows it, you know, blows off blows or cheats in some way or shows some character weakness. Um, and the tournament itself is a good place to see the character under stress. That's part of the reason it works, um, is because there's stress going on during the tournament. So. Um, this sort of instance from Yvain, from Shechendra Troy, um, is one of the uh, sources. There are many Arthurian sources, parts of all, um, a bunch of the other Shechendra Troys, Mallory, a lot of places you can pull themes from and scenes. Um, but most of these scenes, remember, would also be known to the audience of the day. We don't, our audience doesn't necessarily know them, so we have to provide some education up front as well. So usually that's in the prologue of the invocation for the tournament, and it's going to take and follow a certain theme if it is. Um, so that's Yvain, that's the early one. It's not a site like actually pot arms, but it's the kind of thing that these things are all trying to replicate. So the next one, we're jumping forward. We're skipping Ulrich von Lichtenstein in the 13th century. That's interesting, but um, I'll cover it another time. Um, this is, uh, some of you have probably heard of Boussico, uh, the Marshal of France during the middle part of the, mid to late part of the 14th century. Uh, traveled all over, um, was purported to have met Fiore de Liberi at some point. I don't know if that's true or not. He claims it. Um, in his prologue, though. Anyway, uh, Boussico took the leave his, of his king, and he and his companions went to set up the camp at St. Ingelbert. Let's see. Uh, did I? He had his pavilion, which was particularly beautiful and richly appointed, erected on a broad meadow. Two companions did likewise in fine array. A little in front was a great elm tree. On each of its lower branches, they hung two shields. This is where the shield or tree idea will come from. Uh, not from this event, but uh, from romance. One signifies war and the other peace. Hanging on one branch was a horn to be blown by anyone requesting a joust. So instead of a bowl of water, they used a horn. Once any challenger had struck the appropriate shield, the appropriate defender was to come out fully armed on his horse, his lance raised, and spur into action. So um, this is very typical for the way these things would go. And you'd set up with the pavilion and the, and the weapons and the tree. And you have different colors of pictures on the tree, or different colors of uh, shields on the tree. And you can choose uh, jousts à outrance or à la plaisance, uh, one, depending on where you're jousting with sharpened tips or not. Uh, we modified that slightly. We do different forms of combat for each of the shields, um, but uh, you can do whatever you want if you're pulling it from history. There's a lot of choices here. This is the only tournament talked about in Boussico's uh, nightly biography, but it's an interesting one. It, uh, it lasts for three days. I mean, it's a whole series of encounters here, so kind of cool. So jumping ahead a little further, in 1449, this is from Olivia de la Marche, Memoirs, also famous because he chronicled the Polax fights of Jacques de Leyden. Um, but in these fights, he's talking about another one, which um, this surprise lasted six weeks, only had uh, seven challengers, a lot of expense for just seven challengers. Uh, in the 15th century, very frequently the person running the tournament or the emprise would, everything would get all set up, they'd just get set to fight and they'd throw one blow or something and the person charged would throw a baton and say, you've done enough. Uh, Olivia de la Marche, the chronicler, talks about this as extremely frustrating to the combatants. If when they show up all that way, they don't even get to fight. And obviously we try to avoid that today. In this one, a bunch of uh, royal or nobility were present and they've got the shields attached to um, cross or a tree, we're not actually sure what the parallel was. Um, then the knight, German knight rides up, presents himself, retires to his tent, um, six squires take to the field, and the action, this is one where it's kind of interesting because the actual combat seems to have taken place on foot with axes, says Ash in the text. The actual combat seems to have, um, or at a time when the duke threw down his baton. So they fought until the marshal threw the baton and said, you've done enough. So fortunately, they're not all equestrian events. Some of them are on foot as well. Um, and so that's a cue we can take as well. Olivia de la Marche is very cool stuff. I'm um, talking about uh, a series of these feats of arms that he was present at or, or um, knew people who were at, but it's still all in French, um, which is fine if you have French. You can go through and find some Olivia de la Marche. I have them in 
on digits, um, if you want to look at them that way, but they have not been translated. And this last one, the famous one in Spain, just to show sort of how all across Europe these things were. Um, all the knights uh, whose attention is brought should be made clear that they are accompanied by nine knights will hold the field at Obrigo Bridge, a distance of five paces from the road, more or less, two weeks before this Apostles Day, where he shall remain for two weeks after the festival um, at the time, uh, unless he's released. There's ways that might happen. So you can release, in this case, if he breaks 300 spears, kind of like uh, some of you may know, Brian Johnson broke a bunch of white pole axes in a paw. Um, with strong spearheads in war harness without shields or charges, nor more than any uh, one reinforcing piece over each piece of armor. Uh, it's another series of technical things they were doing with full plate in the 15th century. Um, so that gives you a series of events that are all very kind of similar in format from the 14th century, taking their cue from the 12th century on. Um, and you see sort of component elements in there. Anybody have questions or want to make comments on these? We go on. No? All right. So here's one. This is interesting to HEMA folks because uh, these are not knights taking part. 31 burghers in the city of Ternai formed a society of the round table in 1330, sending out invitations to heralds to many towns to come the following year. 14 cities came, each company was met, escorted their lodgings. They took the names of Arthur, or uh, somebody from Arthur's time, so it's technically a round table. Um, and then uh, they basically did a combat in the thing. We don't know what the relationship of this might be to the fighting schools and so on. This is in 1330, so before most of that got going. But you can see an interest amongst the burghers in the cities in echoing what the nobles are doing. And this is at a time when the power of uh, the economic power of the cities and towns is rising, and so the noblemen and the burghers want to uh, gain the social prestige elements that the nobles have. So they did um, sumptuary laws so they could have access to the same sort of clothing. They bought country estates, um, and they held these sort of chivalric festivals, sort of mimicry for what the nobles were doing. So for those of you who are not doing military stuff but are doing more civilian stuff, um, there is precedent for it, even in a civilian context, in a city context. Um, so I threw that one in there just kind of for interest. And this is uh, the date, 1330 here, so uh, probably that would go up all the way up to the end of the 15th century. All right. So you see that most of these things are based on romances. And um, the idea of romances is to... Uh, teach about morality and, and physical action and so on, primarily ethical, but they are supposed to be practical texts. They don't teach you how to fight, but they do teach you how you're supposed to bring that martial power to bear. Um, and so the pot arms is supposed to be a blend and bring in some of those elements, not necessarily fantasy elements, but um, it should bring in and offer opportunities where you can show those things, in particular generosity and things of that sort. This is a great time to show that. Uh, next time on Friday, we talk about participating in what I'll talk about, ways that you can do some chivalric gestures during the tournament or around the tournament to help with that. The gallery has a big opportunity here to show what they think is important. Um, and if you balance that with what's going on in the field, it can be really cool. Um, mostly they drew from the Arthurian stuff, but there are other things too. Um, the Tales of Alexander, the classical history of Rome. Sometimes you'll see Paws set up with those themes, um, the Nine Worthies or no theme at all. You don't actually have to have that. Uh, recent ones we've done, we did a 100 Years War one in Hawaii. We did a Tax Day pot arms in Hawaii. We've done a Horatio at the Bridge one before. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you might pull this off. Uh, Seven Sins was one that was done in another place. So um, lots of opportunities to weave it together. What you don't want to do is get lost in the theme and lose the martial nature of the event. And you've got to still have the fighting be, be a focus. And it's easy to get lost if you try to shoot for the moon too high. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the next one. Okay, one point I want to make here is the pot arms is absolutely not a chivalric duel, and it's not a judicial duel. Um, I think there's a misconception based on the popularity of HEMA today as to that knights went around dueling all the time. Um, that is really not the case. It's very rare, historically. A judicial duel 
is a win-loss situation where one person wins and the other person loses. Uh, pot arms and most deeds of arms as Charnay defined them are supposed to be net wins for, for the participants. So uh, this is a very different thing. In fact, in judicial duel, if you're pushed out, um, you could be hung. In fact, they're trying to discourage this during the 15th century. And uh, pardon me, we've got some people entering. Um, they were trying to discourage judicial duels during the 15th century. So they would even have a threat against the victor because they've now brought or conducted manslaughter against the loser. Uh, so these things didn't happen as often as we uh, might think. There, there certainly was um, some discussion of them and some, some interesting rules and stuff. But texts like Talhofer and Paulus Coward were basically showing you a judicial duel, not a feat of arms. You might consider a judicial duel a kind of feat of arms. And it would be, but it has that very important difference in that um, somebody's losing and somebody's winning. It's a zero-sum thing. Um, so a little bit different. Uh, but some of the, all the techniques would be similar. Um, the point would be a little different, though. You're trying to push the guy out of the list. That's not usually a pot arms thing. Um, you might do it. So duels are pretty rare um, as we go forward. Uh, does anybody want to throw in on that or have a question about that? Might be a point of some debate in some communities. So. so the distinction between the two is whether or not there's a win or end state at the end of it and whether or not it's to settle an issue versus just to raise everybody's renown. Right, or celebrate the whole spectrum of virtues. Yeah, that's right. That's what I see the difference as anyway. Okay. Good question, Michael. Okay. So I have a question to that. So yeah. with a with a tournament though, um, I, I would I would think even though everybody is having a net gain, there could still be a winner, like somebody who was oh, absolutely. Totally. the win the best, you know, the person who won the prize, the person who's at the top. There's just nobody who's yeah. losing being penalized or being right. accused of something or, or, or hung, like you said. Well, and I'll, I'll clarify, because uh, most paws do declare some kind of winner in the 15th century, at least. Before that, um, your victory in tournaments was usually by a claim. So the other opponents would just, I mean, you pretty much know who's done the best of the course of the day. Mm -hmm. And they would recognize them in an informal way. As the 14th century comes to a close, we come into the 15th century, um, you do start to have a victor selected, but not by a win-loss tree or something like that. Um, it would either be selected by the, um, the tenons would choose amongst the venons who was the best. We'll talk about that more on Friday, but, um, or the gallery might choose. And it doesn't actually have to be an or. You can have multiple prize winners from this. So, um, but it depends, and that's a tradition that we started in the company of St. George, and I think I've seen it elsewhere too, where individual combatants decide to, um, honor someone else, which is where the term honor really comes from, right? You're recognizing somebody's virtue for things that they've done. Now, you can also lose renown if um, you've got the wrong attitude out there, if you obviously don't make an effort to come prepared, um, if you're not fun to fight. Um, all those things can cause you to lose renown. That's what, otherwise, it wouldn't be a test. Um, however, if someone has been invited and decided to participate, probably they don't have those issues. And they show up and it should be a net right now, a net gain for everyone. Um, so, but as you said, Micah, there's no, you know, net loser at the end of it. Um, there's, there may be a winner, but the idea, if you follow Charnay's logic, is that everyone who participated will usually get named in the chronicle as to what happened. So the reason that's true is because they're all worthy of renown, so their names are listed. Now, if anything spectacular happened, positive or negative, that will also be listed. Um, and so it would be more or less renowned for those people. Does that make sense? So it really becomes more of a matter of degree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a good way to say it, Tom. I think that's, that's probably how I'd put it, too. Um, and, you know, the good part about this is that if you're participating as a novice, you're going to earn some renown. Now, first of all, the novice doing it gets more renown right off. It's the first one. Um, but also... Um, you know, if you challenge the most difficult person on the other side, well, there's renown to be gained in that, um, rather than, cheat, you know, challenging someone you think you can beat, um, because you're actually striving for a higher plane. So um, it isn't something that we keep track of on a score sheet, but it's pretty clear if you watch. Um, and that's why focus is so important, 
you want to keep the focus on what on the fight that's going on. You don't want people sitting on the side of the field talking about you know their computer programs on the weekend because the idea is that everyone's supposed to be watching and deciding how much renown is earned um, from their own perspective. So keeping focus is pretty important, which is why you have you know a, a circle of pavilions and a you know a fence or a barrier or something like that um, to keep the the energy focused right there. Because as a combatant, you'll see you can feel the difference, like in a big tournament, when the focus is all on it. The PA tries to get that for every fight and to make sure every fight has that focus, whether it's an individual fight or a group fight. And I think the SCA has done a good job of this, and the ACH POTN guys have done a pretty good job of this too, um, trying to set that focus up. Um, and I think you know there's some cues that we can see as we, if we look at images, uh, we'll look at more of them next time. Um, to see how well they focused it. Now, a, a feat of arm, I mean, a judicial duel has that focus too, but it's the zero sum thing. So a lot of ways you can create that focus, um, but you want to look for opportunities. You want to recognize people that are doing the right thing, have the right attitude, bring the right stock. Who's prepared? Who is this important to? You can tell. Um, they're the ones who repainted their shields and came with a, you know, a nicely embroidered tunic and also do the, make, you know, the best challenge. The challenge doesn't have to be flowery, but it has to be sincere. Why are you out here? What are you doing? And prep helps with that. We'll talk about that next time, how you can prep, um, what things you can do to do it. If you don't think you're articulate, how you can still make a good field, you know, good field impression without having to be, you know, a golden haired uh, herald and we're having a herald speak for you. Because uh, I think it's better if you speak for yourself, but that's a personal opinion. Um, so anybody else, anything else on this one? Uh, I was wondering, yeah, is our self calls, you know, calling hits on yourself, would that be an example of, um, I guess, the generosity or chivalry? Yeah, I think it comes from that. Um, it's kind of the way the SCA has done it for a long time. We adopted it in the Company of St. George, and then the School of St. George has adopted that too. Partially for that reason, partially because the assumption is that's the person who knows how the hit was, the person that got hit. But it does put the stress on the combatant to. Um, you know, give the benefit of the doubt to the opponent and to maintain that sort of presence. Uh, some combatants re rebel vigorously against that. Like, I can't think about that when I'm fighting. I don't know what happened. Uh, to me, that's a function of preparation. Um, you need to have that presence of mind to be there. And for me, that's a safety factor too, because if you can't do that, then how can you possibly stop if something really happens? Um, so we've kept it as a core element of our culture in the Skull of St. George. The SCA has a core component of theirs. Um, and that's different from what you'll find in some other arenas. And there's vigorous disagreement about this. And there, there's weaknesses to that too, right? If a person doesn't call a blow, what happens? Well, for a noun, if everyone thinks that blow came in really well or several blows came in really well and they don't take it, that damages the renown. So the mechanism still works. Now they may, in a double elimination fight, they might win a fight, but that can't happen in a pile because they can't steal a fight. So if they go off the field and the tone was bad, everyone knows it was bad. So, um, and you can also lose a fight and still win in the popular mind. I mean, you can get beat to pieces, but have such a great attitude about it because if it's such joie to come back when you're out there, your, other, your fellow combatants look at you, I want to fight him next time or her. Because that looks like so much fun, that's what I want to do. And that's how you measure it. Actually, as a defender, you'd measure it, you know, am I being challenged a lot or am I, people reluctantly challenging. That's the renowned mechanism in action. It's telling you what's happening. And it's giving you feedback right away. So yeah, I would say, Eric, that is a key component of it. Although you could do it with judge blows as well if you wanted to. And that's certainly a, a choice that um, you could make depending upon who you expect to come to the tournament and what their traditions are. You might flex that depending upon what happens. So good question, thanks. Anybody else on this one? I thought this one might elicit some, some commentary. There have been a, a few tournaments in the steel fighting community where they've done both structures, where you have yeah. that objective victory state, so you've got the winners, first, second, third place, what have you. But then at the end, they'll ask the gallery or the other fighters or whoever to nominate the, the favorite fighter or favorite team or chosen person or whoever for this. So you'll see both of those mechanisms in place sometimes, or one or the other, depending on what the tournament is. Right? Yeah, and it's up to the tournament sponsors to decide just what they want, you know, which mechanisms work for what they're doing. Um, even when I served, you know, I was on the throne for an, in an SCA context, 
we would have the tournament victor, but then we would call up somebody we thought was most chivalrous and after that and make a bigger deal of that. Um, so there's ways you can do it in any mechanism. I think you can work it. Uh, that's just up to vision of the, the tournament sponsors. So um, yeah, you can, anything can work if you've got the right you know, um, attitude going into it. Um, you want to encourage good behavior. That's really the point here behind any tournament is to encourage the kind of behavior that we're looking for, both in terms of generosity and also in terms of prowess. So. I just wanted to chime in and uh, like kind of affirm that we've seen this behavior a lot. We had a paw over Valentine's Day. It was uh, a tournament of love and swords. And one of the mechanics we wanted to use to reward this um, was an exchanging of little Valentines. We had uh, a few events. One of them was sort of a double elimination, so more traditional. But the, uh, the big focus was we had little pre-made uh, little Valentines where you could issue forth a challenge where you, you long to feel their blade against yours or whatever, and you would you give them some sort of a fun Valentine. And it wasn't the people with most wins necessarily who had the most valentines the the prize went to the person at the end who received the most valentines yeah. and that was our uh casanova for the day um but we didn't tell them ahead of time that that's what the prize entailed you just had to give valentines as you normally would and we had a couple of young guys where they didn't win all their fights obviously they 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 won about as much as they lost but they were just so gracious about it and they were so fun to watch they jump around they're really enthusiastic uh you present them a valentine and then they'd be like how could i refuse such a request and they just had so much energy for it um that you know it wasn't some of our our old timers who win a lot of their fights who received a lot of valentines everyone's like yeah i know how they fight they're really really good but like this guy, this guy is, this guy is fun to fight. I feel engaged in the fight. Um, so we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun with that. And it was very rewarding to see uh, people's eyes kind of light up when they get the challenge and they step onto the field. And it wasn't about who had the most wins. It was, uh, you know, the issuing of the challenge and then the picking of the terms for the challenge that really engaged people. I'll, I'll be completely honest. This wasn't I, I didn't have this in mind when we did it, but the fact that all the Valentines were dirty puns was almost a challenge on people's <laughs> boldness as well. How yeah. brave are you to stand up and, and say this out loud to somebody's <laughs> face loudly in front of the room? Yeah, they were all pretty naughty puns, but <laughs> it, was, it was Valentine's, so we had to go with it. But like, you had to be very bold in issuing your challenges. Um, and people really, really got into it. It was very fun. Um, so yeah, I... I I second, I really like the paw format where it's not just about who has the most wins, it's about the presentation, it's about the energy, it's about engaging with others and being able to get that renowned. It was also extremely telling afterwards, we went and uh, we went to like Village Inn and got pancakes after the tournament and everyone was talking around and having coffee and stuff and I was like, the people who didn't go for pancakes, the, the guy who won the Casanova didn't go for pancakes. Someone was like, oh man, I wish he was here. I would have congratulated him. He did so well. And oh, geez, you see, you see that shot that came in from so-and-so? Oh man, I can't believe he didn't take that. Like that was ridiculous. And like, it's really apparent how people's reputations spread through the social interactions afterwards. It's a pretty connected community up here. So it's, it was very much a display. Like people weren't talking about who won the double elimination. They were talking about the challenges. They were talking about who did what crazy trick or who, you know, took that shot really well. Or did you, you know, did you hear what so-and-so did or whatever? It was, it was great. So. Yeah, I think we'll, and some of that uh, has kind of, <laughs> Edward III's tournaments when he came back in celebration were apparently quite raucous as well with, uh, clerics con complaining that uh, some of the women were wearing men's clothes and how terrible this was and things were happening that should not be happening around the tournament field. You know, but that's how the tournament was. It's very boisterous and rowdy and, and fun. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to capture all that stuff. And ultimately, you do want to have all the show and the, the, uh, all those things. You just don't want to lose the prowess also because then it can really fall apart. Right? But I've seen this happen on a few occasions as well. Um, but you know, if you, the idea is to blend them and connect them because they are connected in the community. The pod just gives it a really, um, a place to celebrate the whole spectrum of virtues, the way I like to say it. Um, I think that's where we go with that. All right, let's move on a little bit. So 
coming from the double elimination sort of SCA community, um, there wasn't anything like this initially. Um, really, it started off in 1991, 1992, um, when we started to establish, see the establishment of tournament companies for the first time. These were somewhat like households, but not quite. They were groups of squires and knights and, and people with rank who got together and decided they were going to set up a company built around a charter. And the charter stated what they were going to accomplish and why they were doing this and so on. These were loosely blended on, uh, modeled on kind of the order of the garter, but also these, this idea of a 14th century tournament, tournament society, which had come up where these guys would band together and go do tournaments. Um, this is kind of a mix of those two things. Um, so the heraldic display was big. You can see on the combatants in the picture, um, they've got matching tunics, pennants, helmet, uh, torses and mantles and that sort of thing, shields a whole bit. Um, and they had done theirs up, and this is the Tenants of Noble Folly on the picture, um, they had done theirs up in a sort of uniform way because the tournaments they were running, the pause they were running had small teams. So their team was sort of almost like ACL does today. Uh, this is earlier on in using a more King Rene style rather than a uh, combat under the old oak tree kind of approach. Um, so at, in 1992, there was both the Company of St. George and the Tenons of Noble Folly both founded at roughly the same time. Um, and we were drawing heavily from Poissart, from romance literature and all that. And we were trying to answer the question, how were medieval tournaments actually fought? Uh, as opposed to this double elimination thing that the SCA had done for a long time. We liked that, but we wanted more. We wanted something that sort of connected back to the renowned mechanism that we were sort of discovering at that point. Um, and the whole idea of these companies was that they would revolve around reinforcement of their, your fellow companions for now. So the heraldic stuff was part way to get at that, the pressure on armor. Most of the early ones were built around one or more armorers. Um, the company of St. George, we actually had five armorers um, active at the time, which made our equipping our guys really easy. Um, and you'd have a competition. Oh, you got a new helmet this time. Well, that means I got to have a new helmet next time. Yeah, okay. Um, and so you'd push each other in a very friendly fashion to steadily improve things. And that created a culture that began to grow um, by that friendly sort of competition uh, with like-minded people. So um, we began to discover um, sources for this. And one of the ones that we'll talk a lot about on Friday is King René of Danjou, who's pictured up there in the Great Bassinet, um, who was a sponsor of some great tournaments in the 15th century. Um, and so the Tenons of Noble Folly really based their identity on Rene. So they made some great bassinets. You can see one in, in Charles Davis's hands there. Um, they made six of these things to match, matching tunics and all that. And they, were, and they looked quite good. Plus they sponsored some really cool tournaments at that time. So the energy was really good. And we played with a lot of different tournament formats, like a King or, um, William the Marshall style tournaments and uh, Edward the First style tournament and uh, King Rene style tournaments. But the pot arms really sort of set up as this is the one that has the most flexibility. You don't have to set it, you don't have to have a huge giant setup, uh, but you can if you want to. And it seemed to really reinforce things. So starting in the early 90s and into the mid 90s, it became extremely popular um, going around the North America. There were also groups in Australia and, and the UK and Canada who participated as well. This is the charter of the Company of St. George done by Gavin Danker in 1992. So we were trying to incorporate elements of sort of reenactment into the thing, but it wasn't a reenactment company. Um, it was, we wanted to get as authentic as we could within the bounds of reason, what we're doing, but we felt that the SCA stuff could get better. Um, so we decided to push on that as one of the things the Company of St. George was trying to do. Um, and I think the um, uh, Tenants Noble Folly and the other tournament companies were trying to do a similar thing. Um, the mechanism for this, this is before the internet really became big and before we could do chats or Zoom or anything like that. Uh, we used, uh, you'll see on the screen the Frenique, the Journal of Chivalry. We used primarily that initially during the early 90s. And we had a couple hundred subscribers to that. And um, that was where we chronicled what was going on. So a lot of the tournaments have accounts in there. We did a sort of chivalric discussion section, which is about a third of the, each journal. We put 10 questions out or so, and then people would answer the question. Uh, you can do that electronically today, and by 2000 or so, we'd stopped doing it because the internet was coming alive. So we moved to a, a KCT website, and then we uh, gradually just let social media take over. 
1996, I did a book encapsulating a lot of this, the book of the tournament. That's where I sort of started in the book publishing realm. Um, and there were, we weren't the only ones there. The Tenants of Noble Folly were also established in 1992. And the, there were at least 15 other companies. Um, in the Frenic 17, I think there are 15 of them listed at the back who were formally organized and held events regularly. Um, and they were all doing their own tournaments and such. So they would sponsor a tournament. I tried to fly to as many of them as I could get to, and I, I, that worked until about 97. <laughs> there were just too many of them. Um, but it was a cool thing. And I think it actually affected the way that the SCA did some of its big tournaments as well. It also prompted a, a reaction against sort of um, heraldic, heraldic display and high, you know, late medieval stuff, um, sort of a warrior culture, counterculture thing. Um, the Skull of St. George really grew out of the Company of St. George. We first were becoming really aware of the fighting treatises in 1999. We wanted to set up and have some people who wanted to focus on that as well as the other stuff. Um, so we set up the School of St. George alongside the company, but then the company kind of atrophied. I moved away from California, we stopped doing it for a while. Um, but recently we've been talking about, uh, Sam and I have been talking about setting it up again. Um, so a new company of St. George again, people who want to get back to doing this hot arms tournament company sort of thing. That's where the Garter medallion comes from up there. So the first of the pot arms we did was done in November of 92 in Berkeley. Um, maybe it's appropriate it was Berkeley, California, but um, so this was set up, it would qualify today for what I call the sort of middle grade, the company pot arms. Um, we had eight defenders and I think 15 challengers at that one, all SCA people, a lot of senior SCA people who had been around forever. Heinrich Upon, who was at the first tournament, Paula Bellatrix, um, Duke Radnor, uh, it's Duke Steve Beckingham there. A lot of future Dukes, I think Uther is the guy with the pole axe who's extended there as a future Duke of the West. Um, and uh, Michael St. Sever is no longer with us. Um, and a lot of people who really thought that's what they had joined the SCA for was that we weren't really, Company St. George was inside the SCA, was also outside. So we reserved the right to do things that had nothing to do with the SCA. Um, so we could push the rules further than what the SCA would allow. Um, and so we tried some events with steel weapons and whatnot and began to explore that stuff. With seven armors, that made it easier. And we also had sort of an auxiliary company in Southern California that did a bunch of cool tournaments as well, also the company of St. George. Uh, but you'll, you saw events all across the country, Maryland, uh, North Carolina, um, Florida, Australia, lots of places. And they started to happen at big SCA events as well. This is what gave the impetus for the combat in the 30 at Penzik, um, which is a little bit different. It's more like that old oak tree sort of thing. It's not quite a pa, but it is a more medieval style tournament than what a double elimination tournament would give you. Um, so all of these things were bound up and happening kind of at the same time um, and grew into the sort of culture we know of today. Um, in 1995, um, I went up to Minneapolis and was able to do this Pot of Robert Ney 3, where they had a ton of people. I think there were. Uh, I think there were 60 combatants at that one. Um, they had a giant castle of love they had built out of plywood, and the gallery really run that event. The ladies really decided what was going to happen when. I mean, you had small groups competing against each other, which was the tradition of the groups up in, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Milwaukee area. Um, so I joined a group, and we had fun that day. Um, they did a Helmschau, which we'll talk about next time. A Helmschau is a sort of procession where you look at everybody's helmet and talk about uh, people's um, worthiness to be in the tournament. You can open up some cans of worms there if you're not careful, but, um, but it's a thing that they did in the 15th century. So uh, they did it up in Minneapolis as well. Um, and it shows that you could do it as a team event, not just as a small, not individual event. I think some of the ACL stuff, the OTN stuff, the live steel community is sort of reflecting some of that today uh, with the difference they don't trust and some other things. And that would have been a very medieval thing, though, to say we're not necessarily going to thrust in this event because we don't want to. Um, probably wouldn't have been thrusting in the King Rene because they had those big bars in the front of their helmets. Uh, so probably lots of pressure, much like an ACL. Um, and then the last one I'll talk about is we had a giant one at Penzik where we had seven of the tournament companies get together and do kind of a stations thing. So you go meet the tenants of Noble Folly and fight what they wanted to fight, which I don't remember what that was that day. And we were doing sword in one hand, though. 
Um, and so you do a series of seven challenges around the end and you collect seven pilgrims tokens for having gone around. Um, and that was one, they're just different ways to run the sort of same thing, change up a little bit. With these big ones though, pacing is very difficult. Some people were stuck waiting in line for a long time at one station and, and couldn't get in at another. So tough to coordinate. And I think the bigger and more elaborate they get, the tougher pacing becomes. Um, it becomes much more of a challenge. We'll talk about it more on Friday, but um, that was a good event. Unfortunately, I have no pictures. No one that I've talked to in any of those companies has pictures. It's unfortunate. Um, and then another one that I forgot about that I want to talk about is these are these Seven Sins versions. These were kind of cool because there were stations again, much like in the Seven Sins in the other one. Each at each station, someone played one of the sins. So what they were doing was they were trying to get the combatant to commit that sin. If they did that, they lost the fight. If they didn't, then they could win the fight. Uh, but there was a, um, a really incredible one where um, it was envy. And you had a guy who was really wanted to be knighted and was you know, at that prowess range where he was probably close, but the knight who was doing it took out from behind his back a rolled up knight's belt and threw it on the ground in front of him. He said, go ahead, pick it up. You know you've earned it. It's just politics keeping it from you now. And the guy started to actually shake and quiver right there. So he said he realized, oh, he really wasn't ready because he thought he was. And that moment clarified it for him. He realized that there was more to it than that. Um, so you can do more with these things than um, just a challenge tournament. Um, that one, you know, there was a, uh, a, uh, a hermit that you'd go to for sort of talking at the end, much like happened in Raven Lull. Um, so a cool little event. There was one, the first one was done in um, Company St. Mark, but then there were several of them done in Northern California as well. Extremely popular with folks. They love that format. A little challenging to put on because you've got a lot of stuff to coordinate in advance, but fun nonetheless. Now, all these paws have some things in common. The emphasis is always on renown. And the, the, and it's always earned by acclamation, so you want to keep the focus on it. Each built a stage of some sort. In the picture here, we did one in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, trying to build a stage, so you've got to focus the fighting. Um, and then the heraldry and the authenticity really, really helps. You can do it with masks and fencing jackets, but it really helps build the moment if you start to build up the equipment. And it can be clothing, but um, you ultimately you do want to try to invoke as much of that as you can. You want to encourage that. Um, in every case, the, the ones that we ran at least, some of the hardest fighting I've ever done has been there. You know, pole axe to counted blows of 25. Kind of thing. That's excessive, but um, you know, you did those things. Um, I can tell you 25 blows received with a pole axe can be kind of exciting. Uh, I don't really recommend it for everybody, um, but it's fun. Um, you can do those things over a barrier. You know, there's all kinds of ways to play with these. Um, but you want to actually give moments in the way you structure the event for these sort of chivalric gestures to come up, times to recognize other people, times to demonstrate that generosity, that respect, and so on. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that next time. Um, I think the 90s ones were very popular in that they changed the SCA culture some and they gave some impetus to some of the other groups coming along um, because some of that stuff was carried into the early DOTN. Uh, this is one of the people who were active in the SCA as well. Um, but as I say, it did trigger a response as well. It was not all positive. I'm saying there was too much show, too much heraldry, not enough emphasis on real fighting. Um, and I wasn't at all the pause, so I can't say, but in some cases that was true. And you definitely don't want to lose that, which is why I lay the caution out. You want to have the fighting is crucial. Because if you lose that, you'll lose the combatants. And that's really, um, without them, it doesn't work. And next time we'll spend some time talking about the gallery as well, what the gallery can do to foster the day and some things you want to got against the gallery doing. And then I think there's some, some real benefits here compared to the way normal tournaments work. Um, you get the chance to really showcase the renown mechanism. It really works well. You can draw from romance, weave all this stuff together. Um, because there's not a point system to work against, people behave differently. In these. They don't try to figure out how many points they can get to get into this tree or that tree. They just go out and have a good time fighting. And that shows that schwa to combat. So it's, it's got something special to it, I think. Um, it also encourages sort of talking about other people's renown. And you guys talked about after at dinner. Um, well, at the first feast we had, we'll talk about that in instance next time. But that's what happens. You get up and you 
talk about what someone else did that impressed you. Um, and you maybe give them a gift at that point. So you're talking about renown, but you're not encouraging, you know, braggadocio. Talk about somebody else's renown. Um, and then finally, um, you know, it, it improves, you know, puts pressure on folks in a positive way to build up their kit with better armor, better clothing, um, really make an effort because that's courtesy to everyone else. If you set it up right, you can encourage that. Um, and then today, I think there's a really cool thing because you can use it in any of these mailings. It works as well in Cut and Thrust, SCA, HEMA, you can use it in any format. You know, or, um, there is, you know, what combat system you're going to use to run it, and that we'll talk about that extensively next time, but not today. Um, so it gives you all these things, I think. Today we have a diverse community, and so there's an opportunity to bring people together through the pop. You guys have been doing it in Alaska to some degree. And I think there's a really good chance to um, be inclusive with it. The Deed of the Swan that, that Sam took part in is one of those kind of things. Um, it's gotten bigger than any one of these groups, and these of arms can sort of exist in their own. So I think there's a good chance, a good opportunity for us to participate both in fighting in them and also in sponsoring them. The last thing is there's just a lot more stuff out there today. It's a lot easier to get the stuff than it used to be. Like we had the luxury of many armors, but now there's a lot of places you can get armors. Only a few armors in the country at that point in the United States, but there's a ton now. So uh, with that in mind, it should be much easier to produce even more cool looking events. So here's some places you could go for more. I've got a, I'll, if anyone's interested, I've got a bibliography I can send you. Uh, but all this stuff's available. The Chronique back issues are all available on the Scola website. Um, these two books on Charnay's thing, uh, Knight's Own Book and Book of Chivalry are just general good sources. Two Turner books are useful. And then lastly, I recorded a bunch of things, sort of things I've talked about today in the Book of the Tournament, second edition at least, uh, talking about it. So all those are good sort of secondary sources. But really, the medieval romances are where you're going to get a lot of your ideas from. So you read through those, and you'll get cool ideas about what to do. Um, same thing with the history of the Hundred Years' War and War and Roses and stuff. You'll get ideas from that. Um, and then finally, next time, we'll talk about the practical matters, how to do it, how to fight in it, how to run one, what to look out for, that sort of thing. So here's the list. I'll breeze by, write this list, because it's just, yeah, we do excite from things. Um, so let's go to the sort of question discussion segment here. What questions do you have, or what would you like to say? You got something, John? Say again? Uh, we have you uh, with the mic. Something you want to say? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> You're going to see more in Oklahoma. Uh, thanks for having me in on this. The uh, company, the Lynx Argent, is a uh, small tournament company forming okay. with members of the Tattershall School of Defense in Oklahoma and the Sombrogi School of Defense in and Western Martial Arts in Oklahoma City. Very cool. Thanks, John. Eric? Um, yeah, I had, a, I had a question as far as, um, I mean, if, if you did want to keep track of points, you know, outside of a PAW event, just uh, even in sparring, could you do kind of a hybrid of, uh, I was thinking something as simple as, uh, you know, if you might lose four points uh, for a stroke to the head, if you call it yourself, it could be three points. And that would be a you know kind of a way of incorporating the chivalric element, but also of uh, um, and also of decreasing kind of the load on judges because you might have an interest to call the call the blow on yourself before the judge did, um, and the judge might have missed that call anyway. But now <laughs> you wanted to avoid the extra point. Sure, I think you could do that. We've tried to experiment when I was in Hawaii with a lot of different point sort of systems. I think my reaction is that. Every time I've done that, I've lost some of the sort of pure purity of the thing, but I could see, you know, there's a lot of cases where you might, especially when you're mixing schools, where you might want to actually have something like that for people to push against. And I like the idea that you would, you know, lose less points if you call it. Sure, that's, that's a good thought. Um, I, but I think you can have it either with your calling, you can have it with judging, you could do it either way, and it'll still work. 
to some degree. Um, it depends really on what kind of you know, stage you build or what kind of atmosphere you build. And this, you know, if you're gonna do judging, the quality of the judges would make a lot of difference because it's really easy for people to get bent out of shape with bad judging. So um, I think you wanna be, if you're gonna do that, put a lot of effort into the quality of the judges and to the sort of chivalric framework that sort of guides the whole thing so that people are concerned about the whole thing. For example, you can't get points for generosity really. So how do you weave that in? It tends to put it just on the fighting alone with the points. And then if you give a chivalrous award or something, that also that tends to be an also ran kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it could be done. I think with the right atmosphere and the right uh, sort of sponsors, you could do it. Well, I, I, you mentioned, you know, challenging people of different levels where, you know, some a novice might get more renowned for fighting. I, I imagine that, that would be easy to incorporate into the point system, you know, where if you challenge somebody who's ranked, you know, X higher, uh, then it might be worth more to that novice than to them or... Uh, sure. You know, Although like it works in reverse, right? If you're a senior person, it's almost impossible to get points then because right. you're not, you're not going to be able to actually build up points that way. We ran a William Marshall tournament sort of based on that kind of idea where the amount of money that you would have to ransom based on your capture was based on your rank. And so what happened was a very interesting sort of historical dynamic where the people who had high rank got very large groups of men around them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're not taking me because um, I'm worth too much. And it doesn't really engage, it doesn't pay for me to engage with anyone because mm -hmm. I'm at a three to one disadvantage. So why would I engage? Um, let my men at arms go out there and do the engagement. So they'll capture and bring him back, that's cool. Um, which was a dynamic that you see in early tournaments anyway. So uh, we were happy that that naturally kind of replicated on the field. Um, we'd also in that we've done a two point penalty if you had a grill instead of a solid face, that sort of thing. Trying to encourage people to you know, bring a better visor and stuff. Um, but, th so there are tricks you can use in the way that you structure the combat rules um, to do that and I would, I think the essence of the pause not dependent on any of that. Um, it, those things that we listed on the list, and we'll go over them again next time, but that, those things will still be there. Um, how successful it is does depend though on how fluid and how accepted the rules are. Um, I, when I run things, I tend to have less rules because um, I want it wide open for people to sort of show the spectrum of what they can do, um, both in terms of generosity for their opponents and their prowess but other groups want lots of rules. So it depends on, but I think the pod itself doesn't matter. You can, that's up to the sponsor's sort of personality and what they want to achieve during the course of the day or the sponsoring group. So that's, that's an open thing. There's lots of room for experimentation in there. The other piece to this, which sort of um, dovetails to that, is that uh, one of the things that is often not done is there was usually a write-up done after the event. You know, where you list what people did, and that serves to expand the renown even further. We've done that periodically. Um, we used to do it all the time. There used to be a portion on the old KCT website that chronicled all these things um, to sort of preserve what people were doing. Um, that's also a time to, you know, to record lessons learned. And we tried this, and it was not as successful as we may have tried, or we would have done this instead next time. So there's sort of a, you have the formal section where you talk about it sort of a, almost a medieval, Expression. And then there's a sort of after action section where it's like, yeah, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this. These are sustains, these are changes, that sort of thing. And if we build up, you know, continue to build up sort of the community around those things, we'll preserve those things and we'll learn the lessons learned as we go. In this sort of new era, we're trying to mix a lot of different groups and weapon forms together. I think maybe today the renown would be, uh, you know, an Instagram or Facebook page for sure. it. Absolutely. It's a piece it's of social media would be yeah. a prime carrier. Of it. Yeah. But there's nothing to replace, you know, being there in person and seeing it. So the people who are there will talk about it. And that's the idea. And you want to do stuff that's so spectacular, people will talk about it. Hopefully you don't do stuff that's so dumb that people will talk about it or so selfish that they'll talk about it. But that does happen. Um, and that's, my mind, it's like, well, I'm sorry, renown mechanism works. It works both ways. So um, you can become, a, you know, if you do a stupid thing at a big famous event, well, now you're a famous jerk. So, um, whereas, so I think it works both ways. Even in a context where it's points or no points, it'll still work. 
Well, you know, I mean, one mechanism could be that if you, you know, if you're, if you lose renown over time, you know, basically if no one challenges you because you're a dirty fighter or you don't have, you're not generous, then maybe you just slowly lose, you know, rank or lose renown. Yep. They yeah. go away. Essentially, they stop coming is what happens. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> no one really wants to play with them, so they go find something else to do. Right. One of the phenomenons we're noticing uh, as far as the renown and reputation influencing scoring in steel is something similar to where it was in the SCA in the old days. You'd, you'd fight Duke so-and-so against some random unbelt. Everybody expects the Duke to win, and then there's a, a, a psychological influence on the scoring thereafter. The same thing's happening with these impartial judges. If they know one fighter's reputation, they don't know the other fighter's reputation. You have to overcome that. And it's, it's sort of a mixed bag, like you're saying, like the more you, you win, the better you do the more renowned you win, the more that's that influences how people see your fighting. But the, the downside to it is that trying to work within that objective scoring framework that they want to establish with the marshals, <coughs> it, it tends to interfere with the actual scoring. So you're, you're less likely to see the upset or the big or the new guy doing really well uh, or making a good impression on everybody or even scoring more points than the other guy. Sometimes it doesn't matter because they're counting everything that the famous guy did and not so much the neophyte. Right. Who does the benefit of the doubt go to? Goes probably to the guy with the better renown. Think of figure skating, right? How is that? Right. And I think that could be tricky with the, the, I put in quotes probably objective scoring because that's really really hard to do. Um, but yeah. Oh yeah, there's no such thing as true objectivity in any of this. You're still that's but that's why they do multiple judges from different angles and they try to vary it up from time to time. There's nothing you can do to cut the bias a hundred percent. So like like you're saying this this renown your reputation it, it influences whether you want it to. Yeah, it can definitely have a downside if you're trying to establish. I could see that clearly. Uh, you see it, you know, on the benefit of even in an SCA context, you'd see it because guys, you know, what, at what point did the marshals step in? The fight's going sideways. Well, if both people have stellar renowns. They're never going to step in. Um, it's up to them to run it. Um, on the other hand, if they're both bad boys and the marshals are tentative, they don't step in then either. So That's one of the things I always liked about submission fighting, if it goes on for so long that, you know, even the marshals are fed up and the crowd's getting bored, right. just beat the other guy till he can't stand up anymore and whoever falls down first loses. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the challenges we allow is to satisfaction, which is basically similar to that, where it's like, okay, I have though signaled my satisfaction before I even got hit. When a guy zigged and I didn't know where he was, like, oh crap, yeah, you won that one. I'm <laughs> totally toast at this point. I had other ones where you just keep hitting each other. It's like that's ah, excellent. It's fight's not over yet. It, it depends, but it does take an art because you've had to you know have the marshal throw down the baton a couple times. Yeah, gentlemen, you've done enough over. That really doesn't mean you succeeded. It means you both failed in the real sense because the marshal shouldn't have to throw that the time. That means you guys couldn't figure it out. Um, and we've had a couple instances of that. Not many over the years, but a few. I'd say another consideration is, is more mechanical, so maybe it's better for next time, but um, when we're talking about putting a numerical value to rank or, or putting some sort of a uh, uh, an objective bias or handicap in place with these sorts of things affecting scoring, impacting scoring based on somebody's uh, rank, is it suggests that you can um, rank everybody, which in our context is really difficult because a lot of our big events, we've had people from different organizations. You know, if it was all Scola, we might be able to say like, yeah, you know, a red belt's worth so many points, a purple belt's worth so many points, and a green belt's worth so many points. But, um, you know, we have SCA people. We have uh, uh, people from um, uh, HEMA groups. We have people from reenactment groups who come out and join us. And, you know, there's like, there's the instructor in their group and the senior student in their group. And there's you know, our instructor and our senior students and our juniors. Like, you can't necessarily compare them to each other. Uh, but when it's loose, when it's, when it's call your own hits and satisfaction, uh, I mean, there is definitely still the opportunity for it to go sideways if somebody's not calling their hits. And we did have an incident with that last time. Um, but they have the worst reputation now. It, it, it forces everybody to cooperate a lot more 
Um, but it, but if everybody kind of plays nice, uh, our experience has been that it works really well. I don't think in a formal PA in the company of St. George, we ever had an issue. Um, and we pushed the limits, with, you know, rebated weapons and stuff when that wasn't done um, because everyone was there for the same reason. So when we started to do some intergroup events, the dynamics shifted a little bit. We had to be a little bit more careful. Um, but I think, you know, I think the objective rule set or judging or ranking or points adds another dynamic that um, you have to be careful because that can, it depends what you're trying to do. If that's your focus, then okay, then the pot can help with that maybe a little bit, at least in terms of the form. But if your focus is actually the renown, then the points thing actually might actually damage that. It depends on how, uh, how you're running. Um, because you don't want people coming away from the event saying, yeah, it would have been a good event, but I just don't think the point thing worked very well. Um, we had a few times we played with that in Hawaii where I don't think it worked as well. As, it was experimental, so we knew that was good. It didn't work the way the company's ones had worked before. Um, but different sort of equipment, different groups, different you know, support mechanisms and so on. Um, but the essence of the thing still be the same, and I still think they can work no matter what, um, how this works. If you so the essence, I think the elements that we covered, um, as, and we'll hit them again on Fridays. The key elements that they all have in common can work whether you want to use points or no points, or rank or no rank. Um, obviously, rank was a very major issue historically, but amongst knights, all knights were supposed to be equal in this regard. So it didn't matter if you were a duke or whatnot; you still competed as a knight, not as or man at arms or what have you. And they didn't. I've never seen an instance in a pa. When they structured it, okay, men at arms are worth this and get this much, knights get this much. You're a combatant. When you go out and demonstrate or lose as you will. The expectations, I think, on the ranking person are higher, certainly. Um, but um, so it's probably harder for them to earn more renown, but it's easier for them to lose it. Um, whereas on the other side, it's easier for novices to gain it and harder for them to lose it because they get exceptions, because they get benefit of the doubt because they're new. So I find the mechanism really interesting, but I could see make aware it would be difficult if you <laughs> were trying to really do an objective scoring system, how well it would work with that. It, in an SCA context, people had accused us early on of saying, you're trying to change crown tournament. You want to make it like a PA where everything is, you know, by acclamation. I don't think that ever would have worked and we never advocated that because I don't think that you could do a tournament like that where there's one winner with so much on the line in this sort of format. I just don't think it would work. Now, can you do the heraldry and all that along with it? Oh yeah, sure. But the challenges, you can do all that, but the way you determine the victor has to be, in that sense, there has to be an objective-ish way to do it. So our open method wouldn't work for that. So, you know, some of this is perception management. What are people expecting when they come to the tournament? Vice, what do you do when you're there? Um, and the sponsor's job, as we'll talk about next time, is to set those expectations and then to manage the day so that People have the opportunity to, have, to celebrate that joie de combat, but to also see examples of the whole chivalric spectrum. If you've done those things, regardless, then you've probably succeeded in having a successful pop. Because people should go home talking about it. And if that's the case, you did it. So, um, that's how I would measure it anyway. Okay, other questions or comments? Yeah, I got one about like when they would be the earlier pod types where they would, you know, stand under a tree and go, I'm yeah. holding the field. Did they, was it just until they got beaten or are they just all comers? No, it's normally all comers over a set period of time. So I call this a, an errands pa. You take your errands and you go out somewhere and you set up. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you could just do it under a tree with a couple, hang a couple of shields up. It'll work. And they would typically go so that everyone is satisfied. So uh, if you're doing it for X number of hours or if nine people show up, you'd fight all of them. Usually. Now there's always exceptions mentioned historically. Yeah, so and such took an injury, so he's out. That happens. Um, you know, we hope to minimize that today, but it does occur. Or you have a you know, major equipment failure. So in those contexts, I would like show up at the side of the field with two pairs of gauntlets, because that's something people didn't often have a lot of. Two pole axes, two spears, so that we'd have matched weapons for everything and some refreshments. So let's do it. I'll be here from one to three. Anybody wants to come up. 
Or you could also do it and say, until I take 50 blows or 100 blows or whatever it is, until I give 100 blows. You could say it that way too. Um, just depends on how you want to host. We, we have an SCA uh, combatant up here who's done something I've been very uh, impressed with and I haven't taken him up on it yet, though I intend to try and remember his exact challenge, but uh, Sir Cyrus recently issued, <laughs> issued yeah. a challenge to the entire populace that he was going to fight. I think he has, oh, yeah, I think he has a hundred rings. I think it's rings yeah, and uh, rings. he'll only give it away if you beat him at a, at a single sword. Um, about and uh he says that he's open to challenges anytime and i don't remember what date he gave but he said he wants to give away all the rings by a certain date so you know please come challenge him so he can do that yeah those are a lot of fun um, that's kind of modeled on a work von lichtenstein's Unishfart, where he brought 300 gold rings and said basically he'll do the thing until he's given up all the rings and he'll travel around doing that so um, and because gifting is a piece of this, we'll see next time I'll tell the story of Jeffrey Matthias and how he made his uh, statement at a feast following the first pot arms, the St. Christian's Day one. Um, and that really impacted people because he showed up and he basically stood up at the feast and made this fantastic speech, made his silver ring away, which he had made. And then everyone's like, well, okay, the bar's been set way higher than where it was beginning of this feast. Um, Jeffrey Matt has done that. So, um, I think the opportunity is that it gets into a friendly competition with people to make it ever um, better. And so that's the environment you want to create, ideally. Um, if you're hearing that, in, and there were Alaskans when we were doing this in the 90s who were doing this stuff too. So there's been you know, some SCA memory of this up there. It's old now, I mean, it's you know, more than 20 years, but uh, nonetheless, it was still, um, Travel at the time. They didn't do a tournament company up there, but they had a couple individuals who were deep into doing those challenges. So we, um, I'm, I'm also up in Alaska uh, and part of the SCA up here. We actually, I think it was five years ago now, we did uh, Lone Prix de Loop Gur, de Gur or something like that. Yes. It was, uh, so we did a tournament company and it was open to um, anybody who wanted to sign the, the charter. Um, and then we held tournaments at different events and kind of tracked wins, encouraged people to show up in um, the, their, their best finery, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it went on for about a year, I think. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think there's been a sort of a renewal in the past few years of, hey, maybe we should get back to some of this stuff. Um, and I, you know, personally, I sort of feel like we dropped the ball a little bit when we started doing a bunch of the school stuff. We didn't keep this rolling. Um, but I thought there were enough companies at that point that you know, us being more or less involved wouldn't matter. But you know, these things go through large cycles as well in the SCA context. So um, I think we hit a long down cycle and now it's kind of on the way back up again. Um, but I think the opportunity for us to now mix with all these other groups is, is particularly cool because now we can have people come from different traditions and fight. The tricky part there is crafting the combat conventions so that they're inclusive, but not dangerous. That's not easy. We'll talk about that in more detail next time. Any other comments or questions? All right then. Um, so the next one will be on uh, Friday at 2 p.m. same time. That's more of an operational one. We'll also videotape that one. Uh, at least we'll try to. We'll see how well this one came out. Um, and we'll post these with a link so people can get to it who weren't able to come today. Um, and hopefully we can use it as a sort of forum where we continue to compare ideas and you know, advertise tournaments and things of that sort. And, you know, generally give a way for people to community connect because I think that most of these sort of communities are really fellow travelers. We, you know, we're coming at it from different aspects, but realistically, at the chivalric core, they're all the same. So they should be. So. All right. Thank you, then. I'll see anybody else who wants to come on Friday. Uh, if I have questions in chat, I'll get to those. I'll reply to you offline. Um, if you have questions, you can feel free to send them to me an email or however. It's fine. I'll answer them there as well. Um, other than that, thank you for coming today. I appreciate it.
Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Thank Thanks you. for having it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. See you later. Thanks. Thanks. Later.